Welcome to this special video where I will talk about ion exchange chromatography and how this is used for downstream processing in the pharmaceutical industry. Well, this is actually quite a special video to me because I said I would make a celebratory video once we've reached a thousand subscribers and that's been the case now. So thanks to all of you for watching. Well, let's talk about or let's have a look at some of the general separation processes. So you will see a lot around membrane separation, which is mainly based around the size, centrifugation, where you need to look at density and weight, extraction and focuses mainly on solubility, precipitation, and obviously have a change in the solubility. And here we look very specifically at chromatography, where you look at affinity. So as you can see, there's many, many different types of chrom chromatography. So you also see gel filtration, affinity, hydrophobic interactions. But we'll only in this video, because there's already a lot to cover, cover, focus on ion exchange chromatography, where obviously the charge is very important. Now look at the principles behind this. So as the separation is based on charged, you will need to look at separating out charged compounds. Um, so a lot of amino acids and proteins that you will use in the pharmaceutical industry, they do have charges. So that does help. And you can do this both ways. So you have both anion and cation chromatography. So you have to imagine if it depends on what kind of resin you have. If you have something in your column which is negatively charged, obviously it will take out the cations. If it's the other way around where you have a positively charged resin, it will take out the anions. So it depends on what you will look at. Now for a lot of amino acids and proteins, the charge is not that simple. And you will need to look at the PI, which is the isoelectric point. So it means that you probably know what a pKa value is, which is all related to the acidity. At the PI, at that point, there is no net electrical charge. And as you can imagine, if you have amino acids, you have like an amino acid group. And then you have a basic group and you might have a side group as well. Um, so you would have both kind of things in there. So you would have things that could have both a negative and a positive charge. And that needs to be balanced out. Often you would have in your um, in your R group, so that changes per amino acid, you would also have something that is charged potentially. So that can also start to interfere with it. And then a lot of it is around of how this molecule actually folds. So if it folds in a different way, the charges can be further apart or closer together. So it's not that easy to actually calculate it. So you would either need to look into literature uh, where you're, where, what point you're working in, or you would need to or, uh, maybe do some titrations. So it's not that straightforward to calculate. And you can imagine that if you do this ion chromatography, you need to not work at the PI because there's no net electric charge there. So you need to be at least one order of magnitude away from it. So you need to be at a range where you have either a positive or like a predominant negative charge on your molecule. And here I just wanted to give you an example of how this works in general. So what you would have in your column will need to have a charge then. So this is what we call the resin or it can be the beads. And at the end, I will give you a couple of, of very commonly used resins. So one of them that you actually see in here where you have a standard solution column and you have a mixture where you have both positive and negatively charged molecules. Now, the BAE is a very common uh, cellulose resin where you will see that's, that's actually positively charged. And um, so that means that the negatively charged molecules will actually bind to it. So anything which is positively charged will kind of relatively uh, come off, whereas whatever is negatively charged at a low salt concentration will bind uh, to your resin or to your beads. Now, if you want to elute this off, you can regenerate the column, which we could do at a high salt concentration of a, with a strong acid or a base, and then you can get off uh, what your negatively charged compound is. Now, there's a, a wide range of resins that you can use, what I said before. Uh, some of them are very strong acids and bases, which means they will keep their charge of a very wide pH range. Um, but there's also weak acids and bases, which only work in a very, very specific range, because as soon as you go above or below that pH, you will see that they will lose their charge. Um, but equally, both of them are very important and weak acid and bases can have greater specificity. 
So optimizing your resin for ion exchange chromatography is often not a trivial task. And the conditions uh, like such as, for instance, the flow rate um, and, and what you would need like in terms of salt concentration to get it off, all of this is very time consuming. But let's then look at a kind of a more practical example uh, where this was related to recombinant interferon production, which where in which we, the viruses were used, or basically recombinant virus. And here they use both the anion and the cation exchange uh, chromatography. So in relatively early on, um, they have like a cell mixture, but they centrifuge it, they filter it in order to get rid of the, the bulk of the, the, the cells and make sure you had a cell free supernatant. And then with anion ex exchange chromatography, you can get out things of there which are positively charged. So example of that could be some proteins and lipids and DNA and viruses. But here you can also see, and I think that's important uh, to note, that ion exchange chromatography is often just only like a small part of a large train of downstream processing. And you will see later on, you still need to do uh, cation exchange chromatography to remove the negatively charged compounds. So which are things like for instance, BSA and transferrin. So it's not uncommon to ha actually have both processes uh, together, looking at both removing the anions and the cations. And why use ion exchange chromatography for it then? So this is a very well established technique. Uh, so people know this very well and by charges, um, you can, as you see, a lot of these uh, compounds, like for instance, certain proteins and DNA, they do have very specific charges. So compared to, for instance, centrifugation, uh, that might not be suitable because it only separates based on the density or, or filtration where you only look at the size. The charges is often something very unique by which you can separate out these biological compounds. So it does guarantee you very high selectivity in that respect. Here I'm going to talk about two very different scenarios just to give you like a bit of a flavor on how this is actually used in reality. Uh, and what we do know is that many microbial systems are very sensitive to pH. And this is very well known in uh, lactic acid production with lactobacillus, uh, where we know that actually when the pH starts to drop, so when your products start to accumulate, this actually acts as an inhibitor. Um, so you never get to full lactic acid production if you just let your product accumulate. Um, so actually, as in many biological processes in our body, the actual substrate uh, or the product that you get in the end, that inhibits the growth. And particularly in this case, we know for lactic acid, and I've mentioned this a few times, the downstream processing can come at substantial costs. And here, this is definitely around 50% of the whole product costs. So it's very important to get this aspect right. Now, a simple way of how you could potentially do this, I think initially you would think like, well, if the pH starts to drop, why don't we just add some alkaline agents to uh, to correct the process, because at least that takes care of the pH. So by actually introducing additional chemicals uh, into the system, you might start to inhibit the process. And that's definitely the case for alkaline agents, where you form products that again can inhibit uh, your lactic acid production. So what's the very simplest way of doing this, is actually to remove the product. So if you would do it in a continuous fa fashion. Now, what you could do if you use something like a pH control, it means if your pH starts to drop too much, you would start to drain something uh, from uh, your fermenter. So that's what you see with that little pump. It will go off uh, for an ion exchange column. And, and there you would only separate off your product. And you see use an alloyant NOH to, to uh, make sure that you remove this from the column. So it simultaneously removes your product. It corrects the pH and everything that's not necessarily your product, that will just go back in your reactor. So in that sense, you're not losing any of the material, and that's very beneficial when it's a loop-based system. Also, this ion exchange chromatography is relatively fast, so there's not much of a delay in the process. So this is a type of in-situ separation, uh, and actually there's more of these compounds, like for instance, citric acids, there's many acidic uh, components, but also basic components, where this change in pH is very prominent. So things like uh, ion exchange chromatography can really play a very big role to improve the yield of the processes.
But obviously it works the other way uh, as well. So you could also have a standard production process. So you ferment it, you probably use some centrifugation or ultrafiltration or cell-free process, and you could have the ion exchange chromatography at the end. So here I will show you an example of a cath ion exchange column that is used uh, in the downstream processing of lysine. So this is uh, actually produced on quite a big scale because it's an essential food additive. And like amino acids, it's an amphoteric molecule, meaning it has both an acidic uh, group, but also a basic count to it. And this is where this PI, uh, that point, that isoelectric point is so important um, because you need to be far away from that. As I said, you will need to have a very specific charge in the molecule and you need to have a point where one of the two actually dominates. So the way of doing it is that you often have uh, either an acidification step or you have another way around where you uh, you have um, you actually increase the pH of it, so you make it like a basic, uh, and that's to make sure that we're operating under the right conditions. In the case for lysine, what you've got then is you have like a quaternary ammonium salt that is formed, and you have the lysine um, as the hydrochloric acid form. So that helps for actually when it goes through the interaction. Uh, of the resin, and you will see that ammonium chloride is released when there's interaction with the resin. As is an example of cation exchange chromatography, it means that your resin is overall negatively charged and it will remove a cationic, so positively charged species from your column. To go forward, we want to elute off the, the lysine, and so that's where you do the elution and the regeneration of whatever is bound to your column. And you can do this with, for instance, ammonium hydroxide. So that's what I said, you need to change the salt concentration. So you need a strong acid or a strong base. Uh, you could also use some water in it, which will then uh, need to be removed by evaporation. So you elute off your lysine, which is then pure from any other compounds. Uh, you, you would crystallize it then to make sure it's more pure. And that's how you get the final uh, product. So there's not really any other commercial uh, product um, or no commercial downstream processing route that doesn't involve this cation exchange uh, column for lysine. So that's kind of really showing how essential it is. And also because separating based on charges is very specific, uh, unlike where you're just separating based on size, for instance. So hopefully here you've seen like a little summary of why this downstream processing using cation or anion exchange chromatography is so important in the production and the processing of many amino acids and proteins. And that's because many of them are charged and so actually using these charges is a very good way of separating them out. So think of, for instance, lots of things like viruses, DNA, negatively charged. So it's relatively easy to remove them out if you work with like a recombinant virus. What it does guarantee is a very high selectivity and can be used uh, in different ways in your downstream processing. We've seen an example where we had in situ removal. So where you actually take something out, you would um, further uh, purify your product, but at the same time you would boost the yield within your reactor. But then whatever else hasn't reacted was returned to it. But you can also use it at the end where you have your reactants and that's being separated first to remove all of the cells, and then it's just part of a train of different downstream processes. There are many different uh, resins that you can use. I've given you like an example of some of the most common ones, so what uh, their names are. Uh, I've mentioned the difference between some of them that are strongly basic or acidic and some that are only weakly acidic or basic, and what um, the advantage of each of them are, uh, and it also specifies the functional group that they use. So there's obviously many more besides them, uh, but this is just to give you an, a flavor of what's commonly used in the industry. So very important in downstream processing, and hopefully if you do work with amino acids or proteins, you will have learned a little bit about how this works and can use this in practice. So if you want to know more about this downstream processing in the pharmaceutical industry in general, then do have a look at our, uh, our playlist uh, where we also look at, for instance, bioplastic production and monoclonal antibody production and how the downstream processing works in that case. Thanks for watching.